Shamath is here. You have thoughts on this? They have no relationships with their customers, and that's, I think, the longest-term problem in that business. Which what do you is, mean? Well, other than, you know, Disney theme parks where you actually come in and come out, the reality is, like, you're living in a world now where um, these people have no understanding of who the customer is. Not their first name, not their last name. They can't figure out what their real intentions are. And I think that's really the biggest problem. So when you compare that to Netflix, or you compare that to any other subscription business online, it's just a really different media consumption model now. Okay, so here's a question that relates. Let's to introduce uh, Jamath. Let, let, let so, me introduce him. A social could, capital founder. Yeah, because Golden State closed uh, out. Jamath uh, yeah. He was an original member of yeah. Facebook's yeah. management yeah. team. I um, Also own, owns uh, a piece of the words. Uh, let me just ask you one question about this, and then I want to talk to you about some other stuff. Yeah. But on the issue of Disney and Fox and all, there's been questions about concentration in these markets. But one of the arguments has been actually that we've been measuring them wrong because what we really should do is compare them to Google and to Facebook Absolutely. who have direct access, as you would say, direct relationship with the customer, Absolutely. whereas most of the, where, whereas a Disney might not, whereas an AT&T or, uh, or a Time Warner, actually AT&T would have a direct relationship, Time Warner would not. How do you think about the whole market? Um, I really think the traditional broadcast media businesses um, again, with, with all due respect, uh, are the least relevant they've ever been, quite honestly. So I think it was a month ago that Google released some data that said YouTube has 1.7 billion monthly visitors. Yesterday, Facebook did a reorganization, and the person that runs their core apps now manages oversight over 5 billion users, or touches 5 billion unique users. So I think the point is that there is just an entire order of magnitude, or two orders of magnitude increase in distribution that's occurred. And so those are the folks that really now control the pipes um, and really shape our ideas and thoughts. And so are the, regulars, are the regulators wrong? Are they looking in the wrong direction when uh, they yeah. start looking? I mean, and, and it, but I think part of it is that the regulators are of a generation where those systems used to be the things that were relied upon. And unless they get enough data and are taught, quite honestly, um, that something new has happened, they're going to reflexively go back to what they're most comfortable with, which was a world right. where, you know, for some of these regulators, where there were literally only three channels. Right. On this particular deal, because you, you've been an Amazon fan uh, for a, for a very, time. very long time, yeah. are you um, happy, sad that they missed out on this? Do you think that they have a shot in, in India? What, yeah, what if, happens here? Um, so we actually invested, and I'm the chairman of one of the largest payment processors in India. Uh, Amazon is a customer. Flipkart is actually a customer. And so we've been seeing this battle unfold on the ground now for seven years. And what I'll tell you is from a starting standstill, Amazon and Flipkart were head to head. And uh, in any given month, Amazon was actually bigger than Flipkart. Um, so the point is, I think it's a two-headed race uh, for domination of what is an incredibly rich market. So that's great. The other thing I'll say is I think it's great for Amazon that it's in the hands of Walmart because now Walmart management has to figure out how to keep these incredibly talented engineers. And the one thing I'll tell you about investing in India is that uh, the labor market there is even more cutthroat than the labor market in Silicon Valley. In that, there is a lot of job hopping. There's tremendous amounts of churn. These talented engineers leave companies at even faster rates than they do the Valley. And so I suspect what happens is post an acquisition, when uh, a talented engineer has a decision to work for Walmart or <laughs> go work for Facebook, Google, Amazon, it's going to be very difficult for Walmart to retain those people. And so then I suspect what happens Meaning is that- Meaning if they're that, using Walmart shares instead of Amazon shares as, and, and, as more? Uh, yeah, and, and what would you rather have, quite honestly? And so I, I just think what happens is um, it's a great foothold for Walmart. It probably stops some of the bleeding in the short term on the equity. Um, but the reality is I think it probably makes it almost a fait accompli that Amazon wins, in my opinion. Is your view, by the way, how do you think, though, just about Walmart writ large, given the Jet acquisition, given this acquisition, what they've done on the digital side, the transformation that they're trying to undertake here? I think it's really courageous, and I think they are the canary in the coal mine for the rest of the S&P 500, which is these stalwart legacy companies are fundamentally on their heels now. And what we have to figure out is how do they adapt? So you have to use your balance sheet, you have to use your stock, and you have to acquire uh, aggressively to try to be in these next generation wave businesses. Well, that's so, an argument for what Walmart's just done, though. Yeah, no, no, so what I'm saying is that's why I think it stops the bleeding. So it's, in my opinion, are these catalysts to see 20, 30% you know, increases on a predictable basis in the equity? I don't think so. But it is a catalyst to say, well, maybe it stops going down. 
If you're Doug McMillan, are there other things out there? Absolutely. Either in the U.S. or elsewhere? And Absolutely. Would you, would you want to be investing in the U.S. or would you want to be doing it all internationally? No, I actually think going international has two um, advantages to large companies like Walmart. The first is that you can actually have a different kind of business model altogether. So going into an asset light business or vertically integrating, maybe owning a payments business, maybe owning payment rails. Those are better businesses with better margins that Walmart can frankly integrate into their business much easier. And then secondarily, these businesses are much cheaper abroad than they are in the United States. So you get a lot of advantages by actually trying to uh, implement the strategy outside the U.S. What do you think about the fact that Walmart decided to go in with Flipkart with someone that was already established as opposed to trying to go it, go it their own way, build everything from scratch on their own? Is this the way to do it internationally the, if you're Walmart? It's the only way to do it, frankly, anywhere because, the again, we go back to the same existential problem, which is that if you're going to try to innovate, you need this unit of human capital, which is the engineer, and those are still quite rare. They're hard to get. They're hard to find. They're hard to keep. And so it's easier, typically, for startups to do that because they can pay them with equity. And so it's much better for Walmart to sit on the sidelines, wait for something to get to scale, use their balance sheet, buy it. And I think they've done that masterfully. So now the question is not just for Walmart, but look at all of these other companies. Right. So back to Disney. Right. You know, what do you do if you're Disney? Buying assets from Fox may have some value, um, but maybe what we should really be thinking about is how do I use the balance sheet aggressively to buy an internet business? Right. Um, I want to switch topics uh, for a moment uh, because you have been a big bull on Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, we had some folks that some people know on our show earlier this week. Becky was out in Omaha. I want to show you what they had to say if we yeah. could uh, roll the tape on Bitcoin from Mr. Munger and Mr. Buffett. The asset itself is creating nothing. I think it's a scumball activity. I would short it if there was an easy way to do it. So there you have it. You have Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, one of whom was calling it a scumball activity, the other saying, Bill Gates saying he would short this thing if he could. And you're saying they're all wrong. Yeah. Explain. Um, well, look, not everybody is right all the time. And I think we have to acknowledge that we all have biases. And look, I'm a disciple of Buffett and Munger. And one of the things that um, they have said for years, which I believe, is you define a circle of competence and you stay within it. And I think it's been clear in his entire investing career that technology is not in his circle of competence. And so the only technology name that he's owned is Apple. I mean, he, you could claim that IBM was a technology company. That's borderline. It's out of uh, that. that. That didn't work anyway. It, right. And, and Apple, I was thinking that. If he got in Bitcoin, if he eventually got in Bitcoin when he got in, eventually got into Apple, it would already be at a million dollars probably. Probably. But Shamath, uh, just going back to this, this, I don't think he looks at it as a technology. I think he looks at it as an asset class that he would put in the same, a similar class with gold. Just it's a non-productive asset. It's an asset that is only worth more if other people agree to pay more for it. That, that's the type of issue that Which he's Which I also about. agree with. I think, I think it is exactly that. I think it is a replacement to gold. But again, but you like gold. You're saying you like non-productive assets. I like in a portfolio. For again, my portfolio is 99% risk on, 1% risk off. And in that 1% risk off bucket, I think that something like Bitcoin is really important. Why? Because it is not correlated to the rest of the market. And the biggest thing that's changed. You don't, hold on. You do not believe that the success of Bitcoin over the past several years has been correlated to the market. I would say not directly correlated, but clearly. So the, the idea that there's as much liquidity and cash slosh, sloshing around in the world has allowed people to buy into Bitcoin in a way that they wouldn't have, frankly, if the that's market. That's different than being correlated to a strong no, economy I know, but or, or so, earnings. So, but there so is look, a, that's just, that's a liquidity Bitcoin. argument. That's not yeah, a correlation. I've been, in the liqui I've been in the Bitcoin market since 2012. And I feel like I'm in two different universes. I need a passport to go between the Bitcoin world and my regular world. These are not the same people. Um, and what I would tell you is the people that own Bitcoin in 2012, all the way up to now, the majority of those people view it as a hedge to the traditional financial infrastructure. Um, whether that's true or not is unclear, but that's how we've all viewed it. Separately, what Joe says is absolutely right. There's a big difference between correlation and liquidity. And the reality is all of these financial assets in the traditional markets are fundamentally correlated. We saw that in 2007. Everything broke down. Things that we thought were hedges went away. And so I think it's really important to not forget what happened there. So in 2018 or 19, heaven forbid we go through another cataclysmic financial event, we are going to see the same fundamental correlation. And so again, I ask, 
why would it not make sense to have a non-correlated hedge? For a small amount of, this is about buying insurance. It was the same reason why in 2007 and 8, the folks that bought simple, simple insurance bought some CDS. You, know, you might as like well buy gold. I mean, at least gold's got a 3,000 year, 10,000 year record of, of being a store of value. I mean, I think that's the other thing Buffett's saying. There's no reason to think this is a store of I, value. I think that's a fair point, but I think that these are not exclusive decisions. And, yeah. um, you know, for, for this younger class of entrant into the market, they probably don't want to buy gold. In fact, they don't want to buy gold, and they want to buy something that's much more digital and reflective of their values. How do you feel, though, about the idea that, that, that Charlie sort of suggested, that there's something sort of scummy about that, or that there's a lot of scum in the crypto world right now, and, and that there's a lot of people who have been sort of sucked into this world that have bought into this world by, by, by some folks who, who may not be as... Um, um. Look, I think it's really unfair to not understand something and then to disparage it. Um, again, I think he's exceptional. I think Warren Buffett is exceptional. I think Bill Gates is exceptional at what they do. And I think it's fair to say that in 30 or 40 years, if I'm you know, a vibrant, successful investor, and right. if I'm back on this show, the idea that I know what's happening 30 or 40 years from now, as well as some other new 40-year-old or 30-year-old entrant into the market, is just not true. The reality is things change. Tastes change. Behaviors change. But Chamath, I think you're, I, I think you're mistaking their underlying concern with it. They don't like gold either. Charlie Munger has said some pretty uh, dead-on things about what he thinks about gold as putting it in your portfolio. This is not about cryptocurrency and not understanding that. It's the way that they invest. Well, his his, his Looking perspective at on productive versus unproductive right. assets is a very valid argument. And, and he started the meeting not talking about cryptocurrencies, but just saying if you took ten thousand dollars and, put it exactly. and you would have put it in, you'd have fifty-one $52 million. million. Fifty, yeah, fifty-one or fifty-two yeah. million dollars now versus you know the ten thousand dollars that you still have one percent okay. do you think he's right on apple you've liked apple yeah you know uh apple you've gone back a, and forth though on apple a little I, bit i think apple is a productive cash machine is it a font of innovation it's uh unclear trending to probably not and i think they would agree with you on that too. yeah and so like, you know, he said it's a again, consumer products go, company go back to company. go back to the world that these guys are experts in you know they're the same people that say you know i want to buy sort of that cigarette butt on the ground with two puffs left, right? That's one of his famous, like, well, they're, they're he famous. said that's what Charlie cured him of his habit of wanting to do that when he was an early investor. They're famous buyers of value, and there's tremendous value at Apple. There's yeah. enormous cash flow at, in Apple. Sure, the, what I'm taking away from this is that if all 500 S&P 500 companies are on their heel because they, they're going to be disrupted, by engineers, I mean, should anyone not be, be STEM at this point? Would you tell your kids? I completely agree with you. I, I, well, I mean, listen, should I anyone think... take French uh, Renaissance poetry? What? For what? I, no, no, I'm no. going to talk to my kid. They should, but here's a problem. Like, look, let's take one step back for a second. So your first comment is so right on. When you look at the half-life of an S&P 500 company, right, meaning the number of years you're in the S&P 500 before you get booted out, it used to be 50 years. Now it's barely 20. Right? By 2035, I think, our projections are it'll be less than a decade. So what that means is this disruption that's happening is happening faster and faster and faster. So today's stalwart companies are tomorrow's dogs. I mean, marketing or, or English or none of, journal, none of that is going to so, be relevant at all. So then, the then you go back to, well, how do you remake human capital in a world where these jobs and these companies are turning over? Look, in my opinion, I think you need to be a little bit more balanced. Right now, we force kids to make decisions. I'll give you an example in my case. I was a person that was interested in lots of things in college. But unfortunately, I was in electrical engineering. You know how many electives I had in five years of college? Unfortunately, no, I'd say you're, you're very fortunate to be in that. But, it's, but it, it means you have a horrible college life. You're not, you're not going out every night, I'll tell you that, that much. Yeah. Uh, but my point is that but I think there's off. a different way to think yeah. about education. Yeah. Where now you can go out every night. Now, now you We're going to continue this conversation. To, to clubs uh, that you own. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're the doorman. Or basketball games. Yeah, or basketball right. games. Get back to our guest host, uh, Chamath Palihapitiya, founder and CEO of Social Capital. He's also part owner of the Golden uh, State Warriors. How many games do you get to, to attend? I would say that uh, seven years ago when we bought the team, it was 45 on. And now? Uh, this year, one. <laughs> I've missed all the playoffs because I've Why? been working. Yeah. So uh, It's been really it? bad. Yeah. Once it, you closed it out and Steph Curry played more than he's played, uh, and he's back totally, and he's fine, yeah, and he's at, fine. This, at this point. Yeah. So you start Monday, Monday in, in, in Houston, Houston also. Exactly. Do you, do you foresee a problem with Houston? No. 
When, what, when do you foresee a problem? Or Cleveland, do you, nope. you don't foresee problems ever. Yeah. You're going, it's going to be no They're problem. They're amazing. So to bring it back to, to what we were talking about, it, the entire S&P 500 being um, disrupted, do you ever see live sports being disrupted? And it, I don't see no. how you disrupt live you know, sports. When I, so there, when, when there was a five of us that came together, the principal ownership team to buy the Warriors, my friends and my family office were completely against it. And they said, this makes no sense. It's a vanity investment. And I said, actually, I think about it completely the opposite way, which is so much of our time is in front of a phone. We are no longer actually looking at people, and we don't have any connection to the people around us. And I thought, if things like Facebook and Google and Snapchat and all of these things get to real scale, which they have in the last seven years, the thing that we're all going to actually want is the opposite of that as well. How do we get together? And I thought sports was going to be the best thing. So, you know, I looked at doing other things as well. I mean, I tried. I dabbled in restaurants, completely unprofitable, I, not I, worthless. I, I, I liked you more because I thought it was an, a vanity investment that you could do because you can do it. And now you're telling me it was about money. Deep not down, money. it was just about money no, 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 again, I mean, about, about being in the right place. Well, no, to be fair, I also wanted to be a 34-year-old minority investor of a basketball. Didn't you want to be on yeah. the, in, on those chairs in those chairs that I, aren't? eight rows up, then you didn't want to be there watching no, right that, there so that, huh? That wasn't that motivated. I, I, like, okay, I'll, I'll take your tickets then. I mean, you, if, you're, if you're in the West Coast, <laughs> I'll take it. Um, no, I really wanted to do it because I thought that it made a lot of financial well, sense. So content and is not disruptible then is what you did. There's certain types of content, content. That it, so it'll never be disruptible. I don't think so. Not basketball. No, um, football will, but for a different reason Why? because of concussions. Oh, I mean, football for concussions. If you, if you go and survey parents, today right. across America and compare that to 20 years ago, I bet you it's probably at least 50% less the number of parents willing to put their kids, strap them into a helmet, yep. and say, go ahead, hit that other kid in the head. So it's sport by sport, it's, uh, you know, baseball's you know, got you, its own problems. You have a whole different view on uh, the NFL. Do I? What's I my view? I assume. I've tell made me this what my view. You've told me for Why years. You, I, I don't need to talk to you. Just tell them what my view is. <laughs> And you, then, you can go to, and then, you can go, then you can go to tell me about how I feel ever. about guns and, and everything. Yeah, people go play ahead. football forever. That, that we're all wrong about I'm not this. Worried about the, I'm not worried about the NFL, no. I think there will be people that, that see themselves uh, as gladiators, which they have all along. You, get, you, know, you do everything you can technologically uh, to protect these guys with, with uh, I think if you, if you, if you else. Think But it's not going away. No, it's not going away, but if you think where's global growth, it's not football. It's not baseball because the games are too baseball long. Baseball's so, local. So and, by the and, way, and here's the other problem with baseball. It's five hours or six. Who has that amount of time? The beautiful thing about basketball is it's a small number of players, right? So you can really build affinity to individual personalities. Right. No you can see, you them, can see them, yep. right? You're up close to them. The game is two and a half hours. It's high pace, lots of scoring. So in many ways, it has the best boundary conditions for entertainment, fun, affinity, brand. I mean, I watch it's just, 24 it's hours of the Masters, though, Jamal. So it just, it By the just way, and, depends on and then, what And then you... there are these handful of events like the Masters, which can be exciting in moments. <laughs> I, I, I like it the entire time. By the way, it's by the one way did, you see, did you see on Instagram Phil Mickelson challenged Tiger Woods to a high-stakes golf match? No. I think they're... Well, I think, I think that would they're, be incredible. I think they're playing it in a, in, uh, at the players in a... Um, in, the, in the group. I think that they're together, and they haven't played much. I mean, I would... Pay-per-view of that. I would pay for that. Okay, so we're not disrupting that. And I guess there's other live events that... Uh, Music. It, yeah. And then, so, the, so then you're talking about the, the delivery, the pipes get commoditized, but content still... So with everything else changing, content still is king. I think original content has tremendous value. So things like sports, which are also unique and highly valuable, have value because it's universal, it's global. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you know, shows that are now produced differently for very specific affinities have value, but not nearly as much. There is not going to be the cultural gestalt moving things that we've had in the past, right? So if you think of something even like Game of Thrones, it's still quite narrow now in terms of its reach. It's not as if it was like Friends even a decade ago where right. the last episode of Friends, you'd have 70 million people or what have you watch it. That, we are past that now. So you make a really interesting point about how all of these companies in Silicon Valley have ac actual access and information directly with their consumers. For a Netflix, does that business model make sense where you've got to spend seven to eight billion dollars, potentially more on new content every time around? So I think, Becky, you're going down what I think is the most important discussion that is happening in Silicon Valley, which is what is the right business model for the future? 
And I think companies like Netflix and Spotify are showing us that having a direct relationship with your customer, where your customer and your consumer are the same, is probably the best long-term business model. Because they can be smarter about the content that they do develop based on what you tell them you like, based on what you watch? Yeah, because or? I think that you have a relationship with, um, with those kinds of companies where you understand the data that's being collected. It's then purposefully coming back to you in ways you, where you can I just asked you a question about that, yeah. though. So Amazon, uh, not Amazon, but uh, Netflix is spending seven to $8 billion a year. Yeah. If we all looked under the hood and really could see what shows are working and what shows aren't working and all of that. Mm -hmm. Do you, th and with, and with the same type of transparency that most networks have, yeah. you think you would say that they're spending the money efficiently? Yeah. You do? Absolutely. So you don't think that it's masking, that no. the cost is masking uh, anything else? No, I, in fact, I think what you'd see is a couple things. There are probably three buckets of content that they're creating. One is to keep people around. Right. One is to acquire new people in existing markets, and then the other one is to help them seed and launch completely new markets entirely. Mm -hmm. And I think when you segregate that out, they all have different values to Netflix, and that's why you end up with numbers that may not seem obvious on the surface, but underneath, I bet you there's a, a strong discipline in science around how they do that capital allocation. I'm just thinking about a world where I wake up on Sunday and there's six soccer games on that I'm going to have to sit through. That's, don't, you're not dooming me to that, Jamath. There no. will be, there will be NFL, okay? Anyway, um, <laughs> Jamath is here. Can you imagine? No. Six, no, no, six three hour soccer games? I mean, I, I mean, Joe, but there honest, will you be. you still watch the same amount of football you did five years ago? Um, well, not for, for that. I have some different reasons, maybe. Why not, you know. I think the answer is uh, no, but uh, I'm still excited about it. And, and also, World Series and, and playoffs, where every pitch, yeah. foul ball, you almost have a, yeah. uh, I mean, that can be great too. Yeah. Every sport can have, a, no, have its yeah. final four. How great is that? Yeah. I, I don't know what to do with the shot clock on, on the NBA. Sometimes I think it's too short because there's no play. There's no plays yeah. anymore. They just run around, you're like in college. Remember college? What if there's like there's a four-point line? Could you imagine if there was a four-point line? Maybe a four. Well, Andrew's very bored now. We're going to move. We're, we're getting out of this. I'm sorry. <laughs> when but we, we digress. Back, let's get back to our guest host this morning, Social Capital founder and CEO, Chamath Palahapatiya. He was an original member of Facebook's management team. In fact, here's what he said about social media and the Internet the last time that he was on this set. You talked a little bit, Chamath, about some of the potential dangers of the internet writ large. Just talked about how your own kids, yeah. uh, you wouldn't necessarily have them spending much time on any screen. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I think the two things that are probably true, irrespective of whatever company is successful at any point in time, is that it's easier than ever to confuse truth and popularity. And so just us as a population of people trying to be informed, it's harder than ever. Um, and then the second thing is that we really have to understand what relationships we have with these companies, particularly when the things that we get from them are free, mm -hmm. right? For example, if someone gave you a car, gave you a car, and the seat belts and airbags didn't work, what would you do? Well, you couldn't do much because the car manufacturer would say, well, what did you expect? It was it free. It was free, right. Um, and right. So I, I guess you're using that as a, as a description of what we should be thinking from Facebook and every one of these we have companies. Gotten, we have gotten incredible value, we as consumers, incredible value for 20 years on the internet for free. And we're finally at a point now where we have to start asking ourselves, okay, should we be paying for some of these things so that we actually have some established expectations? Now, that doesn't take away the ethical responsibility of every company to treat us fairly. But there's probably going to be a basic set of expectations that everybody lives by. And then, frankly, by having a, more of a paid relationship, you, you pay, can expect more. Would you pay more. for Facebook? If a version of it? Um, a version of it, sure. With no sponsors, or what, how would you? Well, it, for me, again, for me specifically, what would I be paying for? I would be paying for assurances around my data and privacy around how I was targeted and tracked. And, and you know, Facebook, Google, et cetera, um, that would be a relationship that I personally, as a consumer, would want. I, I think the bigger issue comes when there were things that were now are now being revealed about Facebook not knowing what was happening with some of that data, let alone the users knowing what was happening with their data. And, and you're right. Um, you should have an expectation that something's for sale if, if you're getting these services for free. But all of these things have led to the point where regulators are potentially going to be getting involved. In fact, the European regulators are getting involved this month. The question is, what will the U.S. do? Will it follow suit? And what, what will that mean for business models? In I, think, I think business models are going to change. I think that valuations 
uh, are going to change. I think that uh, these companies will get re-rated. Why? Because two things are going to happen, in my opinion, if I had to forecast the next four or five years. We have European regulations, as you said, around data privacy. Other countries will copy it. Then we will realize that they're insufficient or that they were not complete or well thought out. That's 100% guaranteed. And then those will slowly change. And what that will do is restrict many companies, internet companies, from gathering data, period. So that's one set of things that probably will happen over three or four years. Then the other big thing that will happen is, again, because this is not a direct relationship between these companies and us as customers, because the real customers are the advertisers that pay, there's going to be a system, in my opinion, that is equivalent to, in the financial sector, what's called KYC, or know your customer. Right. So today, I can go to any internet site I want, use a credit card, and I could spend millions of dollars to amplify anything I want. That's probably a world that has limited days. Hmm. And in that world, I suspect what governments will say is, if you intend to run advertising in my country, you have to start small, identify who you are, be legitimized, be validated, and then you can slowly grow. What that does is dramatically slow the funnel of how revenue accretes to these businesses. Quick investment question for you. I don't know if you yeah. saw this tweet. This Jeffrey Gunlack, we were at Sone together, and he had a tweet. I just wanted you to clarify this first. He says, guy on stage <laughs> uh, after me, and I think that was you, at Sone on the second day, told me he's short Facebook since January. Then on TV, he said he disagrees with the short call. Both can't be true. What I, what I said to Jeff um, and what I said on television is you cannot short Facebook based on Mark's testimony and a correlation to oil. That to me does not make any sense. And what I said on television was if you're going to short that business, you have to take a step back and ask these other more fundamental questions about business models. Were you short Facebook? Uh, I was not short Facebook. So he was wrong in his tweet. When he said that the guy said he was short, fa we he, short Facebook he, in January. If he was again, we we should not talk about the past. But I, I was not, I am not short Facebook. My fund is not short Facebook. We we believe in the company. But we there was like a time where you might have been no, short Facebook. No, 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 no. And we don't. I don't. And again, it's not it's not good to sort of bring up the past. But no. Talking about that though, what the case that you just laid out yeah. is that you do think a lot of these companies' valuations will come down if they can no longer aggregate advertising dollars the same so, way. So look at it a reassessment. Yeah, so look at it in a different way. Look at Apple, right? Look at the multiple on Apple. Even though now it's approaching a trillion dollar market cap, it used to be a business that traded at 30 or 40 times right. that today yeah, trades at 12, seven or eight times yeah. or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so you've had multiple compression. And I suspect that these bigger companies will have that same kind of re rating. But the drivers of it won't necessarily be scale. Mm -hmm. I suspect will be some form of regulation. Shamath, I want to thank you so much for being with awesome. us today. Always great, great to see always you. Always awesome to see you. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.